Baruch Hashem, we're learning together on December 18th of 2020. Um, this is the last day of Hanukkah. We lit eight candles last night, but we still cling to that last uh, the hours of the feast. So this will be Hanukkah, day eight, until the sun goes down. Baruch Hashem, and um, we have skipped a week. It's so great to be back and we will not be skipping anymore. Uh, Bezrat Hashem, with God's help, um, we need this touchstone. I need this touchstone. And we're doing this only for the glorification and magnification of the Lord our God. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. From Proverbs 3, 6, Baruch Hashem. Let's make the next few minutes last forever. We are still learning from the Hebrew prayer book, from the Siddur. The lesson today is Chodesh Tevet. Uh, Rosh Chodesh began um, on Wednesday evening of this week, which is very special. It always falls out during Hanukkah. And so we take this light of Hanukkah into a new month with us. And so the lesson is Chodesh Tevet al Hanisim. The miracle is we. The way to brilliant change is paved by good intentions, but only the pure can walk on it. I sit beside the lights of this feast of dedication and ask myself, where did an entire week go? Brought to heart is a lonely soul out there in the world somewhere, dark, cold, afraid, stubborn by pain and hardened by bitterness like a stone in the night, growing icier as the winds whip around it. Like the stones of the walls of Yerushalayim, hard and cold, but all at once, all it would take is another element. I pray that this soul, and any soul like, like this soul, would find that element, which is warmth, love, forgiveness, repentance, the redemption and the restoration of all that was perceived as lost. A stone can become solemn and frozen when alone, but a stone can also hold so much heat it can provide the high heat to cook a meal to comfort and sustain the weary traveler. All it needs is the warmth to get there. All it needs is someone to start that fire and keep it there. I ask for mercy for where I have failed to do my part. I paved the road. I walked, but I am impure and not whole with myself or my king. The promises I made to the self I need to the promises I made to the self I need to become have not been earnestly kept. For this I repent. And as we have learned, the last and most vital part of Teshuva is steps toward change. Eternal light, this is from Chabad, I believe. Eternal light, the flames of the temple menorah have been dark for many centuries, <clears throat> but the flames of the Hanukkah menorah can never be extinguished. Even in the darkest of times, even in Hitler's camps and in Stalin's gulag, those flames shone brightly. Even the mighty winds of oppression and of assimilation have never succeeded to tear them from their wicks, because the flames of the temple menorah were given to us from heaven above. But the flames of Hanukkah, the Hanukkah menorah shine by our own achievement on earth below, wrought of the Jewish blood and self-sacrifice, of our undying commitment to the generations to come. A flame gifted from heaven may at times fade, but the flames we have squeezed from the depths of our own souls will shine forever. This week, the sixth and seventh night of Hanukkah, contained another chance for a fresh start, another recycle of the moon, another opportunity for renewal. Within this period of rededication, Rosh Chodesh Tevet. Tevet comes from the word Tov, which means good. This is indeed what we pray for as we begin the month with the last days full of light from Hanukkah and enter into a month which begins a period of mourning leading up to the remembrance of the destruction of the Holy Temple. How can a period like this be reckoned as good? I suppose that it is a chance to find the depths of what went wrong. 
and believe that it is never too late to make it right, to er overturn the decrees against us. Don't turn off, tune out. It's time to press in. I must remind myself of this and also to seek to find the good in all situations. The 10th of Tibet is marked as a day that the siege began, leading to the destruction of the Holy Temple. It is also known as Yom Hakadosh Haklali, the day on which we mourn those whose date or place of death is unknown. This to me is very poignant, as we are always meant to be remembering the lives lost to tyranny, to megalomania, to hatred, to darkness, to evil. How many do we have left to tell this truth? How many didn't want to see it coming, yet it came, it has come, it is here, this day. What is ahead of us as Americans? How will we respond? How will we behave? As we leave the month of dreams, we ask, did the light of Hanukkah usher in for you a realization of the dream that Hashem has for your life? Did we learn the lessons from Yaakov and Yosef, from Yehuda, this season, from the season of light? to struggle with the enemy and with God and prevail through holding tight to that which will never fail us. Baruch Hashem and blessing the Lord through everything we do, to believe in family and hope that our fellow will delight in our dreams and accomplishments as well, that we will have people in our lives who will hear our cries from the pits and show up to pull us out or try to. Did we grasp the inspiration it will take to flee from evil and leave behind the, that which tears us down and apart? Did we imagine that nothing is beyond our grasp when we remember the glory in the Lord despite what it might look like we're facing? To repent and declare, I am not right. Look at how not right I've become. Can it be our practice to declare upon being asked, how are you? Me, I'm living the dream. Because we are. We are players in this dream of Hashem. And there will be strange parts and scary parts and frustrating parts, but also unimaginable breakthroughs. It is said the eyes of Israel were clouded after the deaths of Ezra and Nehemiah, both marked on the ninth of Tevet. This loss of these leaders throughout the Babylonian exile was um, a tremendous blow to the people. What do we do when a good leader ends his time of instruction? How are we to feel? I believe that more than half of the country feels something similar to this. I know I do. Even those who are relieved come along with many who are still yet uncertain, especially as information that might have molded an outcome are, are finally being revealed according to the distorted, twisted plan of the media and puppet masters behind the scenes. But what shall we do and how shall we act? Life must go on and the true mission has to be set before us centrally, no matter what it looks like. Too long have you sat in the shadows. This line comes from a scene from The Lord of the Rings. The king of Rohan has been put under a spell and has this demonic, nasty sidekick, we'll call him, whispering bad advice and destructive commentary into his ears. He has become covered in cobwebs and dust, gray and ashen. His eyes are covered with a film and his entire kingdom is in gloom. This is how it has felt ever since I began to realize our earthly champion might not be retaining his seat with which to advocate for the unborn and for Israel. While I witness the media whispering lies and deceit into the ears of the helpless and the hapless, while I watch good people surrender their morals for preferences and standards for feelings, and I grow weary. 
At a point in the film, the hero comes in and says to the evil counselor and the cursed king, Be silent. Keep your forked tongue behind your teeth. Too long have you sat in the shadows. I release you from this spell. I will draw you as poison is drawn from a wound. Breathe the free air again, my friend. My prayer would be that this nation would react as the king does when freed from the delusion. He finally sees the truth all round about him, recognizing the love that was always there. And he says to his niece, who has been waiting on him and tending to him all the while, I, I recognize your face. Truth will be seen. Truth will be seen. In the meantime, let us tend to one another and be faithful until that day. So this prayer, Al Hanisim Va'al Hapurkan Va'al Hagavurot Va'al Hatishuot Va'al Hamilchamot Sha'asita Avotenu by Yamim Hahem Basman Haze. So, this is the Al Hanisim that we look at. Vav. This Hebrew letter is also the word and. When a Torah parsha begins with the letter Vav, it is taught that it is a continuation of that which came before it in the text. It is as if the previous section had a dot 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 and continues with Vav. And whatever comes next. Al Hanisim begins with Vav, and we can marvel at this, noting that we have just taken in wonderful blessings of the year, along with the challenges and the struggle. Vav, and we thank you. Whatever has come before, we thank you, Hashem. So the Al Hanisim prayer begins, and we thank you for the miracles for the redemption, for the mighty deeds, for the saving acts, and for the wonders. Miracle. What is it? The impossible made possible? But who defines what was impossible? Things may seem impossible to us, but are perfectly reasonable to others, or to Hashem. So this can't be the definition. Is it something taking place that could never have taken place had the divine hand, so to speak, not become involved? Webster's defines miracle as a surprising and welcome event that is not explicable by natural or scientific laws and is therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency. But before we investigate what the Hebrew word for miracle tells us we're going to pause and sign back in because we want to have a full hour to record this next part so baruch hashem sign back in and find part two of our video shabbat shalom so sign back in if you can pam Hanukkah, Hanukkah, light the menorah. Let's have a party with the Zahora. We gather round the table, give you a treat. Said we want to play with him that comes to eat. And while we are playing, the candles are burning low. One for each night they shed a sweet light to remind us of days long ago. Baruch Hashem, I am starting part two of the video, and we are learning together today. Hi, Baruch Hashem. Okay, I'm just going to start again, okay? All right. So we're learning part two on December 18th, 
of uh, learning from the Siddur. It's entitled Chodesh Tov Al Hanisim. Sorry, Chodesh Tevet Al Hanisim. The miracle is we. I had just read the first part of Al Hanisim which reads, and we thank you for the miracles, for the redemption, for the mighty deeds, for the saving acts, and for the wonders. And just ask the question, well, what is a miracle? So as Webster's defines it, a surprising and welcome event that is not explicable by natural or scientific laws, therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency. The Hebrew word for miracle as the Hebrew always does, tells us a much more expansive story. Ness, standard, banner, flag, something to be seen from afar off. What a wonder. One of the deeper purposes of Hanukkah is to remember Amalek. We are taught to never forget Amalek, who is a descendant of Esav, who we have entered into the season reading about in the corresponding Torah parashiyot. And his spirit, which is anti-Semitic, anti-Zionism, anti-God, this spirit in the world, taking shape within any number of groups, peoples, nations, or entities in this world, so is this spirit of Amalek. Here we are today, attempting to consider what a miracle is. And the first place this word shows up in the Bible is when the children of Israel have just left their bondage. They're vulnerable and weakened, and Amalek strikes. The battle is won by the supervision of the Lord, and Moshe names the place, The Lord is my banner. Or it could be translated, God is my miracle. Uh, so it says there, Hashem Nisi. So we can infer that the nature of a miracle has everything to do with overcoming this spirit, doing what Hashem has asked us, his Torah for our life, for our con continuation as a people, and the preservers of this life-granting word. The Torah torch, God's light in the world, fulfilled and revealed and upheld by the Messiah Yeshua. There are only two Torah contexts found other than um, this mountain called Miracle, where victory was marked. Amazingly, it is the context wherein the people of Hashem were coming toward the end of the wilderness generation. They continued to wallow in woe and doubt, surely disheartened and discouraged by their missteps and the consequences of their lack of faith. They blame Aaron and Moshe for the demise of so many, and Hashem strikes them with serpents to find healing. The people are instructed to gaze upon the bronze serpent which Moshe fashions and raises up as a ness, a miracle, a standard for them. Later, Yeshua tells us that it is by his being raised up like a banner, like that serpent on the pole, upon the cross which would lead to the miracle of his resurrection, his rising. By this, all people would be called to him and be given the chance for miraculous healing, salvation, and eternal life. Just as a side note, the context of this conversation is Yeshua speaking with Makdemon, Nicodemus, who um, began with stating, Yo, you must be the Messiah. I mean, look at the miracles you've done. That's my interpretation. In battling over time, the truth of Yeshua's Messiahship, some have stressed the importance that a miracle in and of itself, is not proof of the divine. Yeshua, in this place, explains to him this very thing. It is not in the capacity for obvious and inexplicable things that miraculous or divine truth is found. It's the hidden places, the heart of man, where a choice is made to, to devote oneself to the spiritual and follow Hashem's eternal paths. From this very first and tiniest step, birth, being born again, not with fanfare or banners in the depths of man. So it's not lost on me this year that we are told that the light of Hanukkah be sacred to the season in accordance with the faith and hope and trust and heart with which 
the lighter lights lights that these flames of fire are actually providing healing for that soul that the center light of the holy day is known as the shamash that corresponds to the messiah and that this serpent is also translated as fiery one wow none of this is lost on me indeed perhaps the idea of a miracle as marking something something to be looked toward a miracle is something to give us hope and you have on the page just the root uh, actually no this is actually the word for miracle ness you can see something lifted up a token to be seen far off a banner which is set up on high mountains um, especially in case of an invasion when it shewed the people where to assemble a standard or flag as of a ship a column or lofty pole metaphorically a sign by which anyone is warned so Bamid Bar Numbers 21, 8, and 9 read, Then the Lord said to Moshe, Make a seraph figure, that's that word of fire, and mount it on a nest, a standard, or miracle. And if anyone who is bitten looks at it, he shall recover. Moshe made a copper serpent and mounted it on a nest, a standard. And when anyone was bitten by a serpent, he would look at that copper serpent and recover Yohanan, John three twelve through 15 reads, If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, as Moshe lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And now I'm going to read the section of Yeshayahu of Isaiah chapter 10. It is 1 through 15. Ha! Those who write out evil writs and compose iniquitous documents to subvert the cause of the poor, to rob their rights, the rights of the needy of my people, that widows may be their spoil and fatherless children their booty. What will you do on the day of punishment when the calamity comes from afar? To whom will you flee for help? And how will you save your carcasses from collapsing under fellow prisoners, from falling beneath the slain? Yet his anger has not turned back, and his arm is outstretched still. Ha, Assyria, rod of my anger, in whose hand is a staff, is my fury. I send him against an ungodly nation. I charge him against a people that provokes me to take its spoils and seize its booty and to make it a thing trampled like the mire of the streets. But he has evil plans, his mind harbors evil designs, for he means to destroy, to wipe out nations, not a few. For he thinks, after all, I have kings as my captains. Was Kalno any different from Karkamesh or Harmoth or Arpad or Samaria from Damascus? Since I was able to see the insignificant kingdoms whose images exceeded Jerusalem's and Samaria's, Shall I not do to Jerusalem and her images what I did to Samaria and her idols? But when my Lord has carried out all his purpose on Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem he shall punish the majestic pride and overbearing arrogance of the king of Assyria. For he thought, By the might of my hand have I wrought it, by my skill, for I am clever. I have erased the borders of the people, I have plundered their treasures, and exiled their vast populations i was able to seize like a nest the wealth of the peoples as one gathers abandoned eggs so i gathered all the earth nothing so much as flapped a wing or opened a mouth to peep does an axe boast over him who hews it or a saw magnify itself over him who wields it as though a rod raised him who lifts it as though a staff the staff as though the staff lifted the man one of only two contexts in the whole Bible for the root word of miracle of Ness, which is Nasas, is found when we read the entire chapter and we get right there the whole picture of Hanukkah, documents and decrees going forth, forbidding the gift of Hashem to his people, his Torah, and requiring the debasement of values and veneration of the flesh, 
a people divided. And it's the story we see unfolding before us to this day. Some willing to bow down and assimilate. Others are fighting back for the righteousness of Hashem. We see idols set up in holy places and consider the things we might venerate in our own homes, that which takes the place of time with our families or from time in the Word. And the miracle, the ness, it is summarized by the very heart of this chapter. The miracle is that a remnant is preserved, that Hashem will bring out of the chaos and havoc a single flask of pure oil, just enough to keep the flame of Torah alive. And although the standard bearer may become weak and faint, it will not fall, because it is Hashem who is doing the supporting. And as we read on in Yeshayahu 10 from 18 through 21, And the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame. And it shall burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day, and shall consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body. And they shall be as when a standard bearer, Nasas, fainteth. And the rest of the trees of his forest shall be few, that a child may write on them. That a child may write them, there are so few, that a child can count them. And it shall come to pass in that day, that the remnant of Israel, and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob, shall no more against stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. In truth, the remnant shall return, even, in the, rem even the remnant of Jacob, unto the Almighty God. In Zechariah, actually in this case, the King James Version was, in my sight, the best translation. It reads from Zechariah 9.16. And this is the other, only other place where this word is found. The root for miracle, nasas. And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people. For they shall be as the stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon his hand. Sorry, upon his land. Lifted up as nasas, an ensign on his hand, land. The other context for Nassas is found here in this beautiful chapter and its telling of the coming king. This magnificently is still the story of Hanukkah, but the victorious side of it, when Hashem grants victory to his people and they take the initiative to clean out the land of that which had defiled it, making way for the king. One cannot escape the echo from our current Torah readings with the declaration that the dry pit will have released its prisoners. Yosef, rising from pits to prominence, is a running theme throughout this season in our pertinent studies. So I'm going to read Zechariah, Zechariah 9, 1 through 17. A pronouncement, the word of the Lord. He will reside in the land of Hadrach and Damascus, for all men's eyes will turn to the Lord like, the, like all the tribes of Israel, including Hamath, which borders on it, and Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise. Tyre has built herself a fortress. She has amassed silver like dust and gold like the mud in the streets. But my Lord will impoverish her. He will defeat her forces at sea and she herself shall be consumed by fire. Ashkelon shall see it and be frightened. Gaza shall tremble violently in Ekron at the collapse of her hopes. Kingship shall vanish from Gaza. Ashkelon shall be without inhabitants, and a mongrel people shall settle in Ashdod. I will uproot the grandeur of Philistia, but I will clean out the blood from its mouth and the detestable things from between its teeth. Its survivors, too, shall belong to our God. They shall become like a clan in Judah, and Ekron shall be like the Jebusites. And I will encamp in my house against armies, against any that come and go, and no oppressor shall ever overturn them again. For I have now taken note with my own eyes. 
Rejoice greatly, fair Zion. Raise a shout, fair Yerushalayim. Lo, your king is coming to you. He is victorious, triumphant, yet humble, riding on an ass, on a donkey, foaled by a she-ass. He shall banish chariots from Ephraim and horses from Yerushalayim. The warrior's bow shall be banished. He shall call on the nations to surrender, and his rule shall extend from sea to sea and from ocean to land's end. You, for your part, have released your prisoners from the dry pit for the sake of the blood of your covenant, saying, Return to Bizaron, you prisoners of hope. In return I announce this day, I will repay you double, for I have drawn Yehuda taut and applied my hand to Ephraim as a bow, and I will arouse your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Javan, and make you like a warrior sword, and the Lord will manifest himself to them, and his arrow shall flash like lightning. My Lord God shall sound the ram's horn and advance in a stormy tempest. The Lord of hosts will protect them. His sling stones shall devour and conquer. They shall drink, shall rage as with wine, and shall be filled with it, like a dashing bowl, like the corners of an altar. The Lord their God shall prosper them on that day. He shall pasture his people like sheep. They shall be like crown jewels glittering on his soil. How lovely, how beautiful they shall be producing young men like new grain, young women like new oil. Sorry, like new wine. Just amazing. The two places where we find this root word for miracle, the entire theme of Hanukkah, we find in the only two places where this root is found, the story of Hanukkah itself, in a sense. The al Hanisim prayer continues reading, you have wrought for our ancestors in those days at this time. This part of the blessing always makes me smile. To know that somehow along the way, Hashem saw fit to call me and my family into this walk in Torah, in attachment to the things that have been lost and are once again being restored to the ecclesia. I smile because I'm grateful that our family will from this time until... I pray generations to come take note and take part and mark and set up as a banner to be looked upon and glean hope from the wonders and goodness Hashem performed at these very times. There's something powerful about knowing that, that with our bodies and our minds and our hearts and our hands and these little candles and this oil and this flickering flame, that we are the echoes of the past that we are indeed holding and passing on that torch. The newer editions of Sidurim, um, this prayer reads, Bayamim hahem uvazman hazeh. The small edition of the u, which means and, may seem like a small grammatical change, but it is highly significant theologically. The traditional phrasing, Bayamim hahem bazman hazeh, means that we thank God for the miracles in those days, i.e. in the times of the Maccabees, at this season of the year. By adding the small u, meaning of the, of the blessing changes uh, quite radically to in those days, in our times, in our own times. The different perspective is clear. The traditional rendition of the blessing is about the victory of the Maccabees back then, in those days, in the winter time, at this season. But the second version implies that God performs miracles in our own times, as in the days of old. Miracles still continue for us. It is only, not only a historical phenomenon. Maruk Hashem. The al Hanisim prayer continues, reading, <clears throat> In the days of Matityahu, the son of Yochanan, the high priest, the Hasmonians and his sons, when the wicked Hellenic government rose up against your people Israel to make them forget your Torah and to violate the decrees of your will. 
Trace it back, my dear ones. Trace it back to the very beginning. The first sin and the decay and demise of all of Hashem's design structure and blessing for His people has come because of one thing. The attempt to strip us of His instruction, His teaching, His Torah, lest we forget this is the definition of the Torah, whose root is Yara, to teach, to hit the mark, Hashem's bullseye for life, liberty, and happiness. Maybe Hashem didn't say, or perhaps you should second guess what it meant, or you don't need that anymore. No. Eternal means eternal. The Torah is good until the last days. It is a gift from heaven which Yeshua fulfilled. And we know the meaning of that word by now. Furnish. Make replete with meaning. Uphold. The enemy has always wished to strip us of his Torah. It is the story which is continually repeated. The same story we have told all week long. The way to defeat the nation of God is to take away the study of the Torah, the Sabbath, Rosh Chodesh, the feasts, circumcision, clean eating. And in those days there were those who said, No, we will cling to the Torah even if we are threatened and mocked and diminished by our brethren. And there will always be a remnant who preserves this Torah. Baruch Hashem, we are a very small and yet significant part of that. Tehillim, Psalm 119, 73-78 Your hands made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. May those who fear you see me and be glad because I wait for your word. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. O oh, may your loving kindness comfort me according to your word to your servant. May your compassion to me, come to me that I may live, for your Torah is my delight. May the arrogant be shamed, for they subvert me with a lie, but I shall meditate on your precepts. The Alohanisim prayer continues. But to you and your abounding mercy you stood by them in the time of their distress. You waged their battles, defended their rights, and avenged the wrong done to them. Adonai, thank you for standing by your people when it was challenging for them to be your people. Thank you for the defense you provided them. We ask for this too. Thank you for causing them to remember their rights as your people, and as for us, I pray you would cause us to remember how important our rights are. For as soon as we are willing to allow the men of this generation and our wicked government systems to take away our rights, it's only a matter of time before they target your people and your Torah. Make us strong and smart to realize we must, we must hide your word in our hearts every single day and keep that gold that no one can confiscate nor steal from us. The al Hanisim prayer continues reading, You delivered the mighty into the hands of the weak, the many into the hands of the few, the impure into the hands of the pure, the wicked into the hands of the righteous, the wanton sinners into the hands of those who occupy themselves with your Torah. Lord, we know that when your people forsake your Torah and bend and bow to the ways of the nations of this world, that this very verse is overturned, and instead of pure, instead the pure become victim to the impure, and the righteous fall prey to the unrighteous. So let it be said of this generation that we loved much, that we strove to occupy ourselves in your Torah, and that this verse may be fulfilled for us as it is. Amen. First Maccabees uh, four six through fourteen reads. But as soon as it was day, Yehuda showed himself in the plain with three thousand men who nevertheless had neither armor nor swords to their minds. And they saw the camp of the heathen, that it was strong and well harnessed and compassed round about with horsemen, and these were experts of war. Then said Yehuda, Yehuda to the men that were with him, 
Fear ye not their multitude, neither be ye afraid of their assault. Remember how our fathers were delivered in the sea of reeds, would Paro pursue them with an army. Now therefore, let us cry unto heaven, if peradventure the Lord will have mercy upon us, and remember the covenant of our forefathers, and destroy this host before our face this day, that so all the heathen may know that there is one who delivereth and saveth Israel. Then the strangers lifted up their eyes and saw them coming over against them. Wherefore they went out to out, out of the camp to battle, but they that were with Yehuda sounded the shofars. So they joined battle, and the heathen, being discomfited, fled into the plain. The al Hanisim prayer continues reading, You made a great and holy name for yourself in your world and effected a great deliverance and redemption for your people Israel to this very day. Yes, Lord, we have seen the miracle that is Israel, being born again from the ashes of the Holocaust, and so many who were taken and lost and whose grave site are vacant, vacant because they were burned instead and cast into the rivers or changed into soap or lampshades. Lord, the horror of life. As we have seen from the forefathers, families torn apart in the worst cases, yet your redemption for our lives is always at hand. We wait on you and believe that although our brethren, even today, threaten us and plan to sell us, and put us on lists and desire to make us pay, to humble us and to cause us to see the error in our ways. Lord, you have been the one who has set our foot on this path and in this way, and it is indeed for a great glory unto thee and a great deliverance and mighty showing of your wondrous will for us. So let us wait upon that. The al Hanisim prayer concludes... Then your children entered the shrine of your house, cleansed your temple, purified your sanctuary, kindled lights in your holy courtyards, and instituted these eight days of Hanukkah to give thanks and praise to your great name. Adonai, sometimes we look at the unrolled scroll of our lives, the story of we, of us, of me, of I, of life, this life. And how we see the smudges, the scribbles of an unattended child, smears of chocolate, stains, discoloration, filth. Sometimes we're rolling the scroll back and dwelling on the past. Sometimes it's the current chapter and so often it seems futile, overgrown, too far gone like my yard. But I ask that you would cause us to have the motivation of your people in those days, at this season. They saw the task was huge. But like our betterment, like our marriages becoming stronger, like our relationships with our children becoming healthier, these huge tasks are so very much worthwhile. Let us be like them and put our hands to the task to make it so, even if it takes much time and effort, let us go forward and not grow weary. First Maccabees 3, 42 through 54. Now when Yehuda and his brethren saw that miseries were multiplied and the forces did encamp themselves in their borders, for they knew how the king had given commandment to destroy the people and utterly abolish them, they said to one another, Let us restore the decayed fortune of our people and let us fight for our people and the sanctuary. Then was the congregation gathered together that they might be ready for the battle, and that they might pray and ask mercy and compassion. Now Yerushalayim lay void as a wilderness. There was none of her children that went in or out. The sanctuary was also trodden down, and aliens kept the stronghold. The heathen had their habitation in that place, and joy was taken from Jacob, and the pipe and the harp ceased. 
Wherefore the Israelites assembled themselves together and came to Masphah over against Jerusalem, for in Masphah was the place where they prayed aforetime in Israel. Then they fasted that day and put on sackcloth and cast ashes upon their heads and rent their clothes and laid open the book of the law wherein the heathen had sought to paint the likeness of their images. They brought also the priest's garments and the first fruits and the tithes and the Nazarites they stirred up who had accomplished their days. Then cried they with a loud voice toward heaven, saying, What shall we do with these? And whither shall we carry them away? For thy sanctuary is trodden down and profaned, and thy priests are in heaven heaviness and brought low. And lo, the heathen are assembled together against us to destroy us. What things they imagine against us, thou knowest. How shall we be able to stand against them? Except thou, O God, be our help. Then sounded they with shofars, they cried with a loud voice. Let our battle cry for the months ahead be that of these brave, resilient, faithful people. Let us restore the decayed fortune of our people, and let us fight for our people in the sanctuary. Let us bring back into the holy place of our hearts clean, undefiled stones, removing the heart of stone and ice and indifference to an unclean place to be dealt with later. Let us focus on restoring and buffing to a brilliant shine our vessels for praise and worship. Fresh hot loaves and songs with music and dance, removing the reproach of those who hate us, and donning the crowns to be cast at the feet of Yeshua, fortifying the house so that it may not be trampled so easily again. First Maccabees 4, 36-58 Then said Yehuda to his brethren, Behold, our enemies are discomfited. Let us go up and cleanse the ded and dedicate the sanctuary. Upon this, all the all the hosts assembled themselves together and went up to Mount Sion. And when they saw the sanctuary desolate and the altar profaned and the gates burned up and the shrubs growing in the courts as in a forest or in one of the mountains, yea, and the priest's chambers pulled down, they rent their clothes and made great lamentation and cast ashes upon their heads and fell down flat on the ground upon their faces and blew an alarm with the trumpets, and cried toward heaven. Then Yehuda appointed certain men to fight against those that were in the fortress, until he had cleansed the sanctuary. So he chose priests of blameless conversation, of blameless conversation, such as had pleasure in his Torah, who cleansed the sanctuary, and bear out the defiled stones into an unclean place. And when, as they consulted what to do with the altar of burnt offerings, which was profaned, they thought it best to pull it down, lest it should be a reproach to them, because the heathen had defiled it, wherefore they pulled it down, and laid up the stones in the mountain of the temple in a convenient place until there should become a prophet to shew them what should be done with them. Then they took whole stones according to the Torah and built a new altar according to the former and made up the sanctuary and the things that were within the temple and the hallowed courts. They made also new holy vessels and into the temple they brought the menorah and the altar of burnt offerings and of incense and the table and upon the altar they burned incense and the lamps that were on the menorah they lighted that they might and give light in the temple. Furthermore, they set the loaves upon the table and spread out the veils and finished all the works which they had begun to make. Now on the five and twentieth day of the ninth month, which is called the month of Kislev, upon the new altar of burnt offerings which they had made. Look at what time and what day the heathen had profaned it. Even in that was it dedicated with songs and citherns and hearts, harps and cymbals? Then all the people fell on their faces, worshipping and praising the God of heaven who had given them good success. And so they kept the dedication of the altar eight days and offered burnt offerings with gladness and sacrifice 
the sacrifice of deliverance and praise. They decked also the forefront of the temple with crowns of gold and with shields and the gates and the chambers they renewed and hanged doors upon them. Thus was there a very great gladness among the people for that the reproach of the heathen was put away. Amen and hallelujah. May it be for our lives. Don't be afraid to try. Don't be afraid that the courtyard looks a mess. Just get to work. I need to do the same thing. Look forward to that day of joy. It's just up ahead. It's always just up ahead. Adonai, we ask that you would accept our blessing of this new month as an offering upon this newly rededicated house and altar. Our lives, everything we have, we give to you. The Rosh Chodesh blessing for the month of Tevet begins. Dear God, with your great mercy, deliver us from our troubles. When we come now to bless the month of Tevet, our forefather Avraham died in this month. Therefore, Master of the Universe, remember us in his merit that he allowed himself to be thrown into the fiery furnace of your beloved, for your beloved name's sake. When the wicked Nimrod rose against him, you sent your help to cool the fire of the furnace that Abraham be saved. So too, Master of the World, protect us in all the months of the entire year from fires, plagues, and losses. Nor should any fire or fright rule in any home of our brethren, the children of Israel. The context for this prayer, welcoming in the month of Tevet, comes from the book of Yashar, which gives us the whole backstory of Abraham of Inu. It is also found in the Midrash. Another story of deliverance despite impossible surrounding situations. And we ask for this, for this month, for this coming year, protection from fires. Fires can represent arguments or confrontation in relationships. This is one reason we are forbidden to kindle a fire on the Sabbath. We are to promote peace at all costs, especially at this time of the week. The Rosh Kodesh blessing for the new month of Tevet continues. May our fortunes shine like the morning star in heaven and like the midday sun so that no enemy will be able to glow over us. Adonai, we all have needs. I pray that you would fulfill them. You've been so faithful to my household. I ask mercy for not being able to give as I would like. I ask for you to inspire me to more ways to fulfill my promises and to give back in not in by not giving away or spending money that I do not have. Lord, you have always made a way for us, but now we are nearing the end of our stores. I laugh a little at this line which uses the word fortunes. But so be it. Lord, set into motion in all of our lives prosperity which would allow for great outpouring for those in our lives who need it, and for a provision of the things we have awaited, which are not monetary. Let there be breakthrough, recovery, and brilliance in relationships, in health, in all areas of our lives which should glimmer and sparkle and shine more lovely than a mountain of gold. The Rosh Kodesh blessing for the month of Tevet continues. God who frees his nation Israel from all suffering, we come before you now to recall the blessing upon the month of Tevet. In this month, many catastrophes happened. On the ninth day, Ezra the scribe and Nehemiah the son of ha Hakolia, who rebuilt the Beit HaMikdash, the holy temple, and took Jews out of uh, the Babylonian exile, they died. Adonai, prepare us for the fast days ahead. As we have begun the work of rededication, which was realized over time and in steps, let us realize that these days are to bring us into deeper and always deepening consciousness regarding how significant our lives and behavior is. Let us take on fasts with willing hearts and in order to take it to the deepest and most meaningful personal spiritual level, that you will inspire us to reach and desire to reach. The Rosh Kodesh blessing for the month of Tibet continues. 
master of the world, remember us in the merit, in their merit, and be merciful to us. Send us, return to us, the righteous redeemer, Yeshua ben Yosef, Messiah ben David, quickly in our days. Amen. The second misfortune that happened in this month is that on the 10th of Tenth day of Tevet, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, laid siege with his soldiers to our capital, Yerushalayim. Woe is to us, and woe is to our years, that our crown has been taken from our head. Every year we fast on this day, so that Hashem, his name be praised, have mercy upon us, and return us to our land. Another great catastrophe happened in Spain on the 14th day when 950 Jews were burned in an, I don't really know how to pronounce this, but I think it's Ato de Fi. Master of the universe, how long will your anger rage against us? An Ato de Fe, meaning act of faith, was the ritual of public penance carried out between the 15th and 19th centuries of condemning heretics and apostates imposed by the Spanish, Portuguese, or Mexican Inquisition and punishment and enforced by civil authorities. Its most extreme form was death by burning. In the 14th century, Dominican and Franciscan priests called on Christians to expel the Jews from Spain. They would go from town to town in the countryside and convince Spaniards that the root of their plight lies with the abuse and the villainy of the Jewish population. These bands of subjects would destroy synagogues, burn Jews alive, and spared nobody unless they converted. Jews would be forced to attend sermons and have Christian preachers outline what the Christians viewed as the errors of their ways, many of which would be the Torah. And, and shooing forth that Yeshua was against the Torah, both of which are lies. And we have to always remember the deep roots of this anti-Semitism and fight it by our love and our return of the Messiah, Yeshua, to his Jewishness and the fact that he never came to abolish the Torah. Let us remember this as we go throughout our lives and as we learn this Bible and com and the complete story unfolding yet. Let us not take part in separating it into halves or using it as replacement theology fodder or an excuse to do away with that which has been taught as antiquated or irrelevant. Not a word from heaven has an expiration date. Let us be the witnesses. We're coming towards the end of our time and I have just enough to do one more part. So please come back for part three. Baruch Hashem. And sign back in for me, Pam. Just one more part. Mom is back. I'm going to start the recording. Hi. Okay, I'm going to start. Baruch Hashem. We are back with part three. Um, December 18th, we are learning from the Siddur 
the title of the lesson is Kodesh Tov Al Hani. Sorry, Kodesh Tevet. But Kodesh Tov, have a good month. Um, Al Hanisim. The miracle is we. We're on part three. We have gone through the Al Hanisim blessing. Right now, we are looking at Rosh Kodesh Tevet blessing, and then coming right toward the end here. Um, check out parts one and two. Baruch Hashem. The Rosh Kodesh blessing for the for the new month of Tevet concludes with the following. Awaken your mercy and redeem Israel from all its troubles, my husband and our children among them, just as you poured favor on Queen Esther when she was taken in this month to King Ahasuerus. So too give us your favor and set kindness and let our fortune be set aright for good. So it should be decreed. Amen. Ve amen. Adonai, how wonderful and meaning-filled your Torah, your people, those who have preserved this way and all purpose and ritual and ceremony and sanctification. Let us learn in order to teach. Let us learn in order to do. We do see and long to see the tov, the good in everything. It is the highest challenge of my life at this point to see that in the world. But I see it in your people. Each thought shared, each song, each prayer, each gesture, each delight. Let us be the blessings that you have made we so miraculously together to be and become. This month of Tevet and for all times. And I have this picture here of the last Hanukkah I lit early this morning. As you can see, it's very beautiful because it's very different. Light arises in the darkness for the upright from Tehillim 112. What is the story of, of this feast of dedication? And what did I learn? What is the point to walking in this Torah, to striving for community, for showing up? For living despite the fact that at every turn the enemy wishes to convince me that whatever I have done is not good and will not be good enough. This last menorah, on this last night, in these last hours of darkness, I gather together the last candles in my house. A few of a, a variety of kinds. A couple are bent and broken, some are longer and some shorter. Eight lights, eight nights to tell a story. It's the story of a miracle, a banner, something to look toward, to look forward to. It's the story of we, an array of people in all different places in their lives, coming together for a purpose, to stand beside one another when a draft comes through, any number of places in my run-down, messy home which is filled with endless nights of memories and purposeful company and events fashioned for pleasure and experiences with him at the center point. The flames dance. They pull upward, higher and quicker, as if the flame is tugging and tugging to be released, that it should take flight and soar off into the room, surely finding its way out the door into the sky and heavenward. Standing side by side, the bodies of these candles are but just but just one that is very low. How does it get so low so quickly while the others are taking their time? The one beside it is following suit, but it's not for the same reasons. The wick is longer and the wax is softer. We can never know the struggles of these bodies besides, uh, beside us. We can look and we can consider, and we can try to understand, and we can ask, inquire, take interest, and take part. Some burn slowly, proudly, and true, retaining their straightforward strength and resilience. Others melt away quickly and are put out into a wisp of smoke. Some burn, but are barely holding on. The miracle is that when we all come together, 
no matter the variance or how different each is or seemingly becomes, something beautiful, intentional, meaningful, dancing together in the draft. Alone, what would it be? Or two or three on this night when the Hanukkah is meant to be full? Well, it is full because we are the miracle that someone cares enough to place the candles in the metal cups? Or was it the friend who gave me the candle of them? Was it the draft? Or the text? Or the warrior or the father who told it to his children? Or the mother who gave up her child to a stranger waiting at another train station in a different country? Or a hero who simply didn't snitch? Maybe it was the one who said yes to the Torah when it was truly hard to grasp, or the one who helped her understand it better. Maybe it was that extra dollar someone didn't have, but the person in line paid so that hot coffee wasn't absent at the start of a hard day after a difficult sleepless night. That someone cares enough, and we stand together, each in our own shape, burning in our own way, yet the purpose is the same. And it wouldn't be the same with just a few. We're on another night. We are the miracle. And we are living the dream. Hashem's dream. Where we walk on this way, paved by good intentions, inspiring one another to keep moving so that we don't get cold. To come near one another so that we don't forget what it feels like to serve a purpose warmed by the warmth of one another. Yes, existence. Yes, that I'm a warm body made of flesh and blood and I have a temperature and I breathe in and out again. But maybe, while we're beside one another, we say a few words and smile. Maybe we utter a few words of gratitude. Maybe catch one another's eye and consider how beautiful a thing the Creator has fashioned to share this space with. Maybe we drift into one another's space and good energy is shared. Maybe we flicker and it looks like a dance. Maybe we sing a song while side by side. Perhaps somewhere, someone out there in the darkness sees us. Perhaps someone out there in the darkness hears the song. Perhaps then the world will be caused to wonder, to awe, to believe. Each one of you, of us, is a part of this banner to the world. That we didn't give up. That we have not yet. My prayer would be for the strength to continue. To be the ensign bearer, strong enough to hold up under the task. Despite the weather, or how life changes, and things are thrown at us. Baruch Hashem, there are others to take a turn holding up this hope for others to see. I'll take turns when you grow weary, and I thank you for being there for me. Shabbat Shalom. Enjoy your last day of Hanukkah, and may you have a very blessed Tevet.